hello everyone. Welcome to another Tech Forward webinar by HTEC. Uh, my name is Milan Jovanovic and I'm a software engineer at HTEC. And today I'll be talking about uh, clean architecture uh, and how to implement it using .NET 5 and ASP.NET Core. Uh, so this is the agenda for today. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, clean architecture, then we are going to dive deeper into each of the layers. And at the end, we're going to do a short demo uh, with some code. Uh, on the right side here, you can see a visual representation of the clean architecture. And you can uh, see it's made up of uh, a couple of concentric circles. In the middle, we have the uh, domain layer, as it's popularly called. Uh, one level up, we have the application layer. And then at the top or at the outermost layers, we have the presentation and infrastructure layers. Let's first talk about uh, what is the clean architecture, uh, what are its benefits, and why should we even use it? So. The clean architecture, one of the main benefits is that it is independent of the database or the user interface. Uh, the clean architecture gives us the ability to completely isolate the application and the domain logic. The inner layers define all of the necessary abstractions that we need for our application, and the outer layers uh, implement these abstractions. Uh, another benefit is that the application core contains the domain model. Uh, this architecture is very testable because of uh, the inner layers defining abstractions which we can easily mock using any mocking library that you can think of. Uh, and another great uh, benefit of the clean architecture is that it makes it easy to do the right thing and it makes it hard to do the wrong thing. So if there is one thing that I would like you uh, to remember is that the clean architecture when it is implemented properly makes it easy to do the right thing and hard to do the wrong thing. So let's actually look at uh, each of the layers of the clean architecture and see uh, what it should contain, what we define there and what it is used for. We're going to start with the domain layer, which is at the core of the architecture. The domain layer contains the core domain or enterprise logic types and all of the necessary abstractions. So what are some of the things that we define in the domain layer? Uh, here we would see things like entities, value objects, aggregates, enumerations, uh, interfaces for something like repositories, factories, or even the system clock, domain uh, services, domain events, and of course custom exceptions. And ideally, the domain layer should have no dependencies on any other projects uh, in your solution. Uh, moving one layer up, we have the application layer. Uh, the application layer contains the application-wide business logic. Uh, it knows about the domain layer and it actually interacts with the domain layer and in a way uh, orchestrates its behavior. So what are some of the things that we define in the application layer? Uh, here we would see interfaces for external services, uh, request and response classes, also known as models or DTOs, commands and queries, validators and some more custom exceptions if we need them. I mentioned commands and queries a moment ago and this comes from the very popular CQRS pattern. CQRS stands for Command Query Responsibility Segregation and the main idea behind this pattern is that we have uh, separate flows in our application for reading and for writing data. Here on this uh, uh, image we can see that the client sends a command which is then processed by the respective command handler and it performs some operation on the database and then uh, a separate flow is sending a query which is processed by a query handler and then we can see that it returns some data from the database. Uh, one great feature of this uh, design pattern is that it promotes single responsibility very well because each command and each query only has one task to do. And this is something that really will improve the quality of your application. Uh, CQRS uh, is easily combined with a very popular mediator library, which is what we use for the implementation. Uh, we define custom interfaces for commands and queries, 
uh, because this gives us a little bit more flexibility. And Meteor allows us to introduce uh, additional behavior uh, before and after requests, such as validation, logging, caching, and exception handling. Moving to the other layers of the clean architecture, we are going to start with the infrastructure layer. This layer contains anything that is related to external services or resources. Uh, what are some of the things that we would define here? Well, uh, we would define uh, persistence, first of all, uh, our repository implementations. If we are using Entity Framework, this is where your database context would live. Uh, things like identity provider, HTTP clients, uh, some storage service perhaps, maybe Azure Blob Storage or AWS Simple Storage Service. Uh, email or messaging clients, uh, message queues such as RabbitMQ or maybe Kafka, uh, the system clock implementation and so on. Uh, it is important to note here that this does not have to be one project. If you need to, you can split it into multiple projects uh, based on your requirements. And the last layer in the clean architecture is the presentation layer. Uh, the presentation layer represents the entry point into the system. It is typically built as an ASP.NET Core web API. And uh, you'll see that this layer is very simple. All that we define here is controllers. Uh, and we actually even go a step further and define controllers in a separate assembly from the web project. Uh, this gives us the ability to control uh, what we can inject into the controllers by uh, maintaining uh, references to other projects. And at runtime, we connect the controllers with the actual web application so that the uh, API is functional. Let's take a look at some architecture diagrams. Uh, here, uh, we are looking at a container diagram and in this box, we have uh, uh, an example webinar management system. We can see that we have two executable containers. One is uh, in blue, the represents the API application, uh, and it's built with .NET 5 and ASP.NET Core. It provides webinar management functionality by exposing a RESTful API. And the second container in gray is our database. For example, it's running Postgres, and we are using it to store our webinar information, participants, and so on. So let's take a deeper look into our API application container uh, with this component diagram. We can see that it consists of four separate components, and we're going to start from the presentation component in the top left. Uh, this component actually exposes controllers for managing webinars and other resources. It communicates with the application component by sending commands and queries using Mediator, and the application component sends the response back also using Mediator. We use the application component to define our commands and queries definitions, uh, as well as their respective handlers. The application component communicates with the domain component using method calls, uh, and it orchestrates the entity interactions that are necessary to perform a certain action. In the domain component, uh, we de de describe the domain model uh, with rich entities and value objects. And lastly, we have the infrastructure component, uh, which is used to implement all of the infrastructure concerns, such as communication with the database. And we can see that the infrastructure component uh, reads from and writes to the database, in this example using Entity Framework Core. So let's move on to a short demo. Here we have an example webinar management application that is implemented using the clean architecture. And we will start from the presentation layer where we have our webinars controller. And let's look at the uh, HTTP post endpoint, which is called create webinar. And let's see uh, how it looks. We can see that it requests a create webinar request from the request body and then uses that request and maps it to a create webinar command which is then sent through the mediator pipeline let's dive deeper and look at the actual command itself we can see that it is just a c-sharp record 
and it contains two properties, name and the scheduled on date. Uh, we're going to take a look at the application layer now. Uh, this is where we define our commands and queries. And let's take a look at the create webinar command handler. We can see that it accepts uh, uh, an iWebinar repository and an iUnit of work from its constructor. And these are actually provided by the uh, ASP.NET Core dependency injection framework. Uh, it creates uh, a new webinar using the create webinar command, uh, inserts it using the repository, and then saves all of the changes and returns the identifier of the newly created webinar. Lastly, we are going to take a look at the infrastructure layer. This is where we define our external services and resources. Uh, and here is where we define our uh, database context from any framework core. We can see that it's very simple. Okay, and let's take a look at the webinar repository. We can see that it's very simple. It only has the insert method implemented that we use in our command handler. So that was the clean architecture. We saw that it consists of the domain, application, infrastructure, and presentation layers. We talked about each layer in depth, what we defined there, what it should contain, and we showed a short demo showcasing all of the separate layers and how they interact with each other. Uh, thank you for listening to my presentation about the clean architecture. Uh, my name is Milan Jovanovic. I'm a software engineer at HDEC and please stay tuned for the Q&A session. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Hi, guys. Hello, Marco. Hello, Milan. And uh, great to see more than 1,000 people actually listening to this. I'm happy that we have really now opportunity to talk with Milan, who's our, I would say, tech challenge super. You know, post challenges, there's thousands of people, you know, breaking their heads, you know, how to solve the, how to solve the problem. Uh, and Milan, we have also a lot of questions for you, of course. Uh, some, some of people are already looking forward, actually, to work with you, looking for job opportunities, having questions. But oh, that's great of, to hear. Yeah. And uh, some of you already have questions that we will uh, also ask. But maybe just uh, for, for the beginning, to start at the beginning, you know, so uh, I would like to hear, I mean, you were a great student also. So all, all these challenges and all these uh, mind games and tech games, that, you know, didn't came just overnight. You know, you, I saw that you were like uh, the clear 10 student also at, at master degree, you know. So can you tell <laughs> us uh, something about your beginnings, you know, is that in DNA or what made you to choose this profession, you know, to become such a great uh, IT uh, developer? Well, uh, I think it started when I was uh, very little. little, uh, little. Uh, I was always uh, attracted to computers. And uh, at the beginning, it wasn't ju just uh, uh, playing video games. Uh, and then when I entered high school, I think, uh, that's where I enrolled into the IT department. And so the next step was actually making a couple of video games of my own. And then after that, you know, I realized uh, what I actually wanted to do, which is to solve some very tough problems. And uh, I became a, a back-end engineer. And uh, here I am today at HTEC. Great. And in the HTEC, you're also having uh, um, quite many opportunities in a way. So how do you see, what, what do you like most being in, in last, let's say, almost three years in, in uh, HTEC? Uh, well, as you said it nice, uh, there are quite a lot of opportunities, uh, mainly because we are growing at a, at a very rapid pace, uh, which means there's also quite a lot of projects to work on. And uh, it, it's great that uh, you have the, the flexibility to basically decide uh, which projects are uh, suit you in a way, uh, are the problems that you want to solve, and then you can talk to your manager and uh, 
uh, make a decision, you know, what is the, the best project for both you as an engineer to continue to uh, develop and also what's good for the company. Yeah, you must be. I saw also a great recommendation for you that you're a big uh, problem solver in a way. So you, I believe you're the one in HTEC, you know, always looking for the toughest challenges. You know, where, where's the biggest problem, you know, to solve, huh, Milan? Probably that's that's how you take challenges also at uh, HTEC. Uh, yeah. Um, let me let me think for a moment. Uh, I'm not sure um, if I can pick only one. There's many of them, huh? Yeah. And if, of course, with, with HTEC growth, uh, I don't know, dear, dear listeners, uh, um, did you heard that uh, also HTEC received 140 million investments, uh, 114 million uh, dollars, not dinners, of course. And uh, this is just confirming that HTEC is on the right track and that hardcore growth is giving also many challenges, opportunities also for personal growth. Um, Mila, how do you see this? You know, is this uh, opportunity that you see also for yourself, not just for the company? Uh, yeah, I'm super excited about this. I, I really uh, am looking forward to, to what the future has in store for everyone at HTEC. Uh, for me personally, uh, I think it, uh, it 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 gives me um, uh, basically a highway to success, if I can put it like that. Uh, it gives me, uh, I mean, I know where I want to go um, as an engineer. Uh, I'm uh, very into the the uh, tech side and the the more hands-on approach of engineering. So um, I'm currently working on becoming a, a software architect. And uh, I'm very grateful for for the opportunity to 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 work on that. And I'm actually uh, I can't wait to see uh, what exciting projects we will have to to work on in the future. Yes, and we have a question here also from Nicolina. Um, hi, I'm, uh, Milan. I'm curious to know what was the toughest process behind deciding on using the yeah, course DB context inside a classical uh, repository. As there is a lot of community discussion and opposing opinion about this. So yeah, first of all, hi, uh, Nicolina. Uh, she actually reached out to me uh, a couple of weeks ago to ask some opinions uh, on LinkedIn, and we had a, a very nice discussion. So uh, it's very nice to, to see you here. Uh, as far as your question goes, uh, I know this is a, is a very big debate, and uh, I'm going to say it really comes down to to personal opinion you know some people don't like to abstract any framework stating that it is already an abstraction or uh, it's already basically a repository and you need a work pattern which i don't disagree with it's just that uh, i really prefer the the flexibility i get from defining my own abstractions and uh, mainly uh, as it relates to, to to writing some tests, mm -hmm. and of and course, there's there's a further benefit from actually encapsulating all the the data access logic uh, behind uh, uh, an interface, the repository in this case, uh, when it, uh, especially when you look at it from a clean architecture perspective, I think it fits in very nicely. Nicely, nicely put, Milan. I'm sure uh, there will be more questions. There's another one coming, I believe, from India. Um, there's there's people from Ghana, Nigeria, India, Serbia. You know, so many countries. I didn't count all. You know, uh, people that applied. More than 1,500 people applied just on LinkedIn. So here's another one. What do you think about having the comments and uh, queries implement uh, mediators? Uh, I request uh, versus defining custom interfaces to decouple the specific library from CQRS pattern. Here's a question. Yeah, okay. I'm going to just yeah. uh, take a moment to read through this. Okay, I, I, I understand. Uh, so, so basically, the uh, the reason we define. Uh, 
custom abstractions for commands and queries. Uh, I'm not saying we're not using mediators I request. I'm just saying we're extending it in a way because that way we can more easily differentiate between uh, what is a command and what is a query. And uh, this also gives us some flexibility when uh, using uh, mediators uh, pipeline behaviors. It allows us to introduce some uh, filters. For example, we want to run certain uh, middleware, so to say, only for commands, but perhaps not for queries and vice versa. So I hope that that answers it. Please let us know in the comments and I'll address it further if it's needed. Thank you, thank you, Milan. One question for me in between. So uh, what do you think um, these challenges that you're, that you're doing? We see, uh, for example, all of this. Is this making also HTEC different from other similar companies? I didn't see many challenges like this uh, happening all the time. So, uh, and I'm not sure if I sh I'm supposed to talk about this, but it, it actually uh, HTEC gave me the opportunity to to learn about LinkedIn, uh, which is basically how I started posting uh, more actively. And then uh, after I got uh, more active, uh, I realized there was a demand for uh, sharing some, some knowledge. And uh, I really didn't see anybody at the time uh, posting about uh, C Sharp and .NET, which is my main technology. So I decided, you know, why not? Why not? Uh, why not let it be me? Uh, and uh, it really uh, took on. Uh, I'm really uh, amazed by the, the the support I get from the community. And uh, most of all, uh, I met so many amazing people uh, that really helped me expand my knowledge. And I'm very grateful for that. Milan, I'm I'm all, every time you know ready to to step aside, you know, since I'm not a tech expert, you know, that you take over all the future tech forwards, you know. So Milan, I think uh, it will be amazing to to see this. And here's a, a question from Syed Harris Hussein: uh, Can you please elaborate on the benefit of using clean architecture? All right. Well, uh, there's a couple of benefits. Uh, I'm going to. First, start with the high-level benefits, so to say. Uh, one thing is that um, uh, it's very decoupled. You can uh, achieve a very decoupled system when you implement the clean architecture. Then there's the the inversion of control that go uh, the, that's going on uh, inside of the architecture. Uh, mainly that we have the domain layer in the core, uh, which ideally should not reference any other projects in your solution. And then all the other layers uh, are allowed to only talk to the layers inside. And this leads to, to very good design overall. Uh, then there's the, the added uh, testability. Uh, it's very easy to write tests in the clean architecture because most of your business logic is going to depend on abstractions, uh, allowing you to easily mock certain services, uh, repositories, unit of works, uh, and you can very uh, quickly uh, get to uh, a, a high amount of tests, allowing you to validate that your behavior is correct. And then another uh, benefit, I would say, is um, it's in in a way it's uh, friendly for uh, people that are just starting out as engineers, because especially when you're using uh, the CQRS pattern, uh, most of your business logic is going to be uh, simple, quote unquote. Um, for example, if, if a command is represents a, a certain business behavior, we're going to handle it with only one command handler meaning we have a uh, very good single single responsibility and uh, it's easy to focus on one thing at a time and uh, you can really uh, get a deeper understanding of the business problem that you're trying to solve good good um, sorry for going on a rant i'm no, just very good. passionate about this <laughs> there's there's many questions and uh, ready next one from coming from uh, ivan 
thanking you for this. Thank you, Anne. Uh, question first. So what is the advantage of using CQRS2 if you have multiple onion modules and want to communicate between them using events what we'll use? Okay, so some very great questions coming from Ivan. Uh, so for question number one, what is the advantage of using uh, CQRS? Uh, I already mentioned it. Um, I think it uh, promotes single responsibility very well. And then uh, you have the flexibility to implement CQRS however way you want. For example, you can maybe start with uh, uh, what I call logical CQRS, meaning you only have you still only have one database, but you're logically splitting your code into the command side, which uh, manipulates the database, and into the query side, which provides responses. And then that gives you the flexibility to further down the road, if it's needed, to maybe uh, split from one database. You go to, uh, to a system where you have maybe uh, one database for writes and then a separate replica database that's optimized for reading. And then there's all sorts of things and complexities that you can introduce to, to really reap the benefits of CQRS. And uh, for, for your second question, if you have uh, multiple Onion modules, this is actually something that uh, I have uh, on my project right now. And uh, we're calling the overall architecture the modular monolith, uh, where basically we have uh, a couple of separate modules that are implemented using clean architecture, but they don't communicate with each other uh, through memory, through method calls. There's nothing, uh, there's no direct reference. And as you said, we use events to communicate between those modules. Uh, what we're using under the hood is uh, RabbitMQ as a, as a message queue. And then we're using the amazing mass transit library to, to simplify the the sending of the messages. A lot of details. You know? So I hope uh, Ivan is happy in the answer. There's more coming. So uh, it's interesting to see where the, all these people are coming. But we see also somebody watching, Joseph uh, watching here in, in Philippines. So even there, Milan is getting some traction. So what will be the next? question that we have on the list what we'll select okay from shifanam how many layers need for make clean architecture well the basic definition is uh what four layers so you need the the main layer the application layer the infrastructure and the presentation layer but depending on your needs this can be more than that uh, meaning uh, if you need to, you can split the application layer into perhaps multiple projects or the infrastructure layer. I've often seen um, defining uh, external services as one project and then everything related to persistence as another project. So really, it, it really depends on you, your project, and uh, what you see it fits. Okay. Let's go to the next one. Thank you, Shifa, for question. I can find out where he's he. coming from. Sunil, should we have one repository per model DB set? If yes, what if we have a lot of models? OK, this is an interesting question. So ideally, you would have one repository per aggregate. So, um, meaning maybe it doesn't make sense to load some entities without some other entities that make up a whole, which is what we call an aggregate. So, you could go that route. You could, of course, define uh, repositories per entity, as you said, or DB set. And uh, if you have a lot of modules, well, you have a lot of modules. You, you can't really avoid that. So you would end up with uh, a lot of code. You can possibly avoid uh, writing a lot of boilerplate code by defining some generic repository. Um, this could maybe simplify your work. OK, I hope you're happy with the answer. A lot of questions. 
also Marco Kerstic can help on some, you know, if there's something. Uh, let me introduce also Marco, uh, just in between, now uh, that we use the time. Uh, so Marco, you, I have also two questions for you. So um, you te our technical lead at HD Group, what do you see as the most difficult part of being a technical lead? How do you motivate your team or how do you lead them through the change? Um, how do you see these things? Uh, yeah, okay. Well, uh, for the technical lead part, you have the... You're basically uh, coming from technical background and uh, you are you are one of the person in the team that are usually the most... I'm sorry, you hear the noise. Yeah, oh. um, Sorry, it's a bit noisy. Uh, so, as a technical person, you've come to the po uh, point in the career where you now should uh, continue development of uh, other technical persons. So, the most tricky part in tech lead the position is that you have to find the right person to continue the technical growth of the company. So, yeah, I would say that uh, the leadership part of the of this role is the most important one and the technology is uh, something that you grow with other people helping you. so the, you have to find the other people and that's the, the whole point of, of the tech lead uh, role and uh, as you asked uh, how you motivate them well usually uh, it is only by communicating with them so uh, as we know these technologies are built from the people and for people. So uh, you have to find people by communicating with people. So this is the trickiest part. And um, coming from this tech side, I would like to ask the, uh, to ask Milan. Uh, first of all, this is. Uh, the community asked uh, a lot of questions that I already had in mind. So I would go uh, to the trickiest one that shows the um, the, the uh, how how good are you at some at something, uh, and this is uh, when would you not use the clean architecture? Okay, asking the tough questions right away. Yeah. So when I would not use the clean architecture? Uh, well, we, we've already mentioned um, a lot of the benefits. Uh, and I'm in general uh, a strong uh, advocate for this architecture. But uh, you have to realize that uh, it comes uh, at a price. Uh, as with all things in software, uh, everything comes at a price. And the price here is uh, complexity. So it's not uh, a simple architecture. It's not very straightforward, especially for someone that's not uh, well uh, acquainted with it. So uh, you have to uh, take into consideration the increase in complexity and uh, perhaps uh, make a judgment call if the complexity is something that you need for that project. Uh, for example, uh, I wouldn't recommend it if you're working on very simple projects. Uh, I don't think it, it can uh, hold its weight. Uh, and also, if you're probably writing a prototype, um, the clean architecture isn't really uh, fast in terms of development, uh, but it does give you stability later on. So if you need to uh, develop fast at the beginning, uh, maybe try something else and then refactor into the clean architecture when you have something that's stable. And uh, also definitely consider uh, if the increased complexity is justified for your project. But um, in general, um, any serious project, especially the ones that we work on HTEC, uh, where we're solving uh, some very tough problems, uh, can really benefit from this architecture. Yeah, sorry, uh, I had to mute myself. Uh, and now back to the 
good one, good questions. Um, uh, from my perspective of a technical person, as you're talking about clean architecture, I can see the domain always in the middle. Uh, and you already mentioned the, the aggregate roots. Uh, is it a natural fit to combine the domain-driven design? And is it uh, always good approach or you should not always combine that? Okay, so interesting. Um, obviously, mm, you could be led to believe that because you have a domain layer, you're supposed to use uh, domain-driven design. Uh, but I don't think that's the case. Uh, I think it's also something that you should decide on a per project basis. Um, one great thing about domain-driven design and clean architecture, obviously, is that it really puts the domain at the center, at the core of the architecture, uh, which is probably where most of your uh, engineering efforts are going to go to. Uh, and meaning you're trying to solve some tough problems. And this is where DDD domain-driven design really shines. But uh, again, there's also the very noticeable increase in complexity when trying to add uh, domain-driven patterns like entities, value objects, aggregates, maybe domain events. Uh, those, those, uh, those are all uh, very powerful and very fun for us developers to use, uh, but uh, you also have to to know what you're doing so then so that uh, you don't mess it up. And when I would not advise uh, using domain-driven design is uh, possibly if um, performance is very important to you uh, or for your project. Uh, domain-driven design has a tendency to be slow on, especially on the right side, because you have to load uh, an entire object graph, uh, an aggregate from the database to perform maybe some simple operation. So you should take note. Uh, yeah, uh, and uh, you already mentioned the, the testing of the, uh, the, uh, the ease of testing the domain layer. Uh, what I'm interested in, it's, uh, it's really bothered my mind when I tried to implement this on my project when I come to testing part. Uh, let's go deeper in technology and take a look at uh, uh, asynchronous programming or async away pattern now available in many languages. Uh, if you put the these async await uh, calls in domain layer, is it the breaking of the encapsulation uh, or is it allowed in the domain layer? Okay, so that's an interesting question. And uh, there are kind of um, many opinions on that. Uh, I see two uh, common and two common approaches to, to solving that. Uh, one approach, uh, which I've used before, is uh, to not put any asynchronous calls into the domain layer. Uh, so you would uh, move it one layer up into the application layer and uh, there you would talk to the database asynchronously or any other services and uh, possibly fetch some additional data. And then you would pass that as a result into the domain layer. And then there's also another interesting approach I saw and I used, I've used it a, a couple of times. Uh, and this is uh, just uh, pass an abstraction which calls some service asynchronously directly into the domain layer. Now, uh, the dangerous thing here is that uh, things can go wrong and probably will go wrong uh, as with any time that you're working with external services. And uh, you have to take that into consideration and see how you would mitigate if, if uh, some service were broken. Yeah, thanks. There's a lot of 
there's a lot of things to discuss here. This this is really a huge topic. Uh, do you have something else here? Uh, let me just take a look. Yeah. Uh, do you think custom exception fit in this architecture? Uh, also, since you are using events and RabbitMQ for service bus, do you use any guaranteed delivery strategy? If yes, can you elaborate? Okay, so I'm going to uh, answer the exceptions first. Uh, what we what we did uh, uh, mainly on on my project and has worked very well for us is to uh, define as many of the custom exceptions in the domain layer as we can uh, because we actually use custom exceptions in our domain layer directly and then handle them in some upper layers um, and we don't use it for control flow we only use it for exceptional situations that really should not happen uh, in a normal uh, program flow so and the second question is uh, very technical. It's uh, in uh, interesting. Um, uh, I would say, I think the approach we use is uh, at least once delivery, uh, meaning uh, when we have the, on the producer side, of, uh, when we produce our messages, uh, we actually use the outbox pattern uh, and we store all of the messages that are supposed to be sent out uh, in one transaction into our uh, Postgres database. So, uh, and then we have a job that processes all of the messages and publishes them. So uh, we have uh, at least once publishing on the processing side, and then on the actual queue, uh, this is where things are out of your control. Uh, what could happen is maybe message re-delivery uh, which is why on the consumer side, we've implemented item potency uh, so that whenever a message comes through, we check if it was maybe already processed before, meaning we received a duplicate from the queue and then you just don't process it. So we, we really tried to build something uh, robust. Yeah, we'll, we've already discussed this, but you could wrap this discussion again. Yeah, uh, let me try to. So uh, we mentioned uh, what are some of the advantages, such as uh, independence from the database or the user interface. Uh, you get uh, a very nice uh, decoupled architecture. The testability is great, and uh, the domain is at the core meaning you're putting a lot of focus on the actual business problems that you're solving. And then the disadvantages are uh, increased complexity, uh, mainly that. And then maybe uh, you should consider if the clean architecture is justified for some uh, very simple projects. Yeah, okay. I think we can cover all questions. I'm trying to dig out something that is not covered by the end of the questions already. Uh, let's see. I see some questions about uh, using Dapper. Yeah. Marco is having a lot of tough questions. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think he likes all of the questions, so he can decide. Yeah. No, we've covered all the things. We've covered all. Uh, let's say these. Um, passing oh, I, I, I think we have uh, our good friend uh, Zoki on the in the comments, and I think he prepared some interesting questions for us. Let's check. let me take a look. Oh, this is a big list. Uh, yeah. Uh, would you use custom exception to build valid value objects? Yeah, before uh, tackling the question, uh, a very big shout out for Zoki. Uh, for those of you that don't know, he was uh, 
uh, recently working at HTEC, and he was actually my mentor. And uh, he really helped me uh, in my uh, journey as an engineer, and I'm very grateful for that. And uh, uh, as far as his question goes, would you use custom exceptions uh, to build uh, value objects? Uh, it's interesting. Uh, I don't think I thought about that before. Mm. I guess it's a it's a valid approach, but um, I'm uh, opposed to using exceptions when maybe you could deal with this uh, in a simpler way. Uh, just uh, perhaps uh, return a result uh, when you create a value object and then signify in that result uh, if the creation was successful or not. I think uh, this is slightly easier to implement than using custom exceptions. Uh, and then you, call, you could also provide uh, an error code if you need to uh, signify what actually went wrong. And then I don't think you have a problem once you persist that value object because it was probably already created in a valid state. So in, in, in my case, I would not go with exceptions. I would try to avoid it, but it's also a valid approach. This is the one that I've seen. Uh, passing data, data between layers in expens uh, expensive is expensive in high availability system. So what do you suggest how to avoid the passing and wrapping the data on presentation layer? Is it this some kind of system that you would skip the with the appliance of the clean architecture? So um, I, I don't think this is a uh, more problem with uh, clean architecture. I think this is maybe between uh, multiple layers talking with each other in terms of maybe separate modules or even microservices. So th there's a couple of approaches uh, that you could take here. Uh, one approach I've seen uh, and that I personally like is actually uh, using data uh, replication, basically duplicating data uh, between services uh, and you would duplicate the data in one module that you need from the other module. And then when you need to present all of the information, you would already have it. You wouldn't need to talk to the other module and you would not care if it, if it were down. Uh, but then there's the added complexity of uh, keeping that data in sync. You would have to think of a way to always keep it synchronized if that's important for you. So that's one possibility. I'm seeing already uh, the question about GraphQL. Uh, what do you think about, I'm not sure if you cover this. Uh, what do you think of GraphQL and have you tried to apply clean architecture approach with GraphQL instead of REST API? So I'm going to have to disappoint you here, Marco. Uh, I really have not worked with uh, GraphQL before. Um, so I don't think I can provide a, a clear answer here. Is the source code available? Uh, yes, I assume so. I don't think there should be any problem. Uh, I also have uh, a couple of more complex implementations on my GitHub. So you can reach out, reach out to me maybe on LinkedIn and uh, I'll give you the source code. It's not a problem. Ooh, I think you could handle this. Well, I'm not sure. What do you think the best way to use Azure Web Service as security prospect? How do you handle securities while communicating, for example, example, a lot hub? I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe I... IoT? IoT hub? IoT. Oh, this is IoT hub. For example, communicating, for example, IoT hub. Well, I've never 
done in this setup um, from the security perspective? Uh, well, there's a lot of ways to handle the security. Uh, you, if in the IoT, you usually are handling this with certificates uh, on the devices. But this is a really wide topic, uh, and this should be tackled uh, at, uh, with the, uh, you have to give the exact use case that you're trying to solve. This is not some, this is not really easy discussion for this, uh, for this kind of webinar. All right, we have uh, some more questions. I'm actually really liking the the questions we're getting from the crowd. They're so involved, they're asking amazing questions. Okay, so Zoki is asking, um, did you encounter uh, a situation where aggregate routes are becoming too large. So uh, this is a common problem when you have, uh, I'm going to use um, uh, maybe an overused example, but uh, let's say you have an order and uh, the order items, and this is one aggregate. So in some systems, uh, there could be quite a lot of order items on an order, which would result in a very big aggregate. So. Uh, it would be expensive to load all of that in, uh, information into memory uh, and then repeat that over a lot of requests and you get some performance issues. So in that case, it would probably be a good idea to somehow split your aggregate so that you lessen the load on the on the server. Uh, the last one as a developer .NET developer, what are the must-read important books do you recommend? Milan, you could give the insight from the perspective of the clean code, and I could give some more insight. So I don't think uh, you should look at it from a perspective of a .NET developer. Uh, I think any good engineering book uh, is going to help your career and your growth. Uh, some of the books that have really made an impact on me were uh, definitely Clean Code. And then uh, there's obviously the, the Clean Architecture book. Uh, and then uh, obviously the uh, the Big Blue book, as it's called, uh, Domain Driven Design from Eric Evans. Uh, that one has really made an, uh, left an impact. Um, uh, there, there's uh, Domain Driven Design in Practice, I think it's called. And then maybe, Karla, you can recommend a few more. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the the one that I'm always... I think it was uh, the one with the bore on the cover, Designing yeah, Data Intensive yeah. Applications. Building Data Intensive Applications. Yeah, that, that's the I think that's the most important book that I've read in my career. It will give you uh, a much... Uh, more info about uh, the, where is data stored. Uh, this topic, clean architecture, is giving you uh, the knowledge how to create a domain, but uh, the book I've mentioned is uh, something that is going to uh, give you the insight of the, where is the data stored. Uh, and how different databases store the data. And at the end, uh, everything needs to be stored. You don't want to forget it. We are running in the last three minutes. So I would say this, let's take this as a last question from Branko. And uh, since it's amazing to have so many questions, uh, and I'm sure that we will have to repeat this one, and we will have to do some more follow-up, actually, and answer in chat. So you can keep asking, don't worry. Uh, we'll keep answering, but not in the live chat since we are finishing in two minutes. But let's take this one, Branko, as the last 
last question. Yeah, uh, this is a, a very nice project that I've seen uh, API endpoints from uh, uh, Steve Smith. Uh, he's uh, also a great .NET engineer and uh, an advocate for the clean architecture. So uh, I haven't used um, API endpoints in, uh, in a real production system. Uh, I have tried it out uh, on a couple of personal projects and I must say, I, I really like it. Um, I would actually go as far as to recommend using it over controllers because um, controllers in the clean architecture, especially, uh, and then when you add on top uh, CQRS, uh, don't really um, serve a purpose. So I think API endpoints fit really well here. And uh, one uh, proof for my statement is uh, actually Microsoft shipping uh, minimal APIs with .NET 6, which is a very similar concept. So overall, I like them. I, I would suggest using them. Uh, you can't do wrong. Okay. Fantastic. So this will be the last one. And just for the end, uh, maybe it's good to know that uh, it's actually all the two, all the people that are interested in and .NET or uh, more opportunities with HTAC. Yes, we have more than 250 open positions. And the good thing is that Marco is also having questions in selection process. Maybe so just for the end, Marco, what does the selection process for .NET position looks like? Is it so tough like these questions or... Is anybody going through, or uh, how can we get more .NET developers also on HTAC? Uh, well, this is something that uh, Milan and I can uh, give an insight as we both are in the team of interviews um, for the dot, for the dot .NET uh, technologies. So, uh, our main purpose of the the interview is uh, to see if the candidate has good technology and personality match for us. And uh, we've tried uh, we've tried to create the process, uh, the simple short process that could be done in one day. And uh, the idea that the kind candidate is the well, we play some kind of game. You are, as candidate, uh, the principal developer of our internal team, and we give you one challenge to build some kind of system. And together, this is not uh, the question-answer uh, kind of interview. We're just building the system. There's no right answer. We're just trying to take uh, to learn in these two hours uh, how do you think how do you solve the problems so the the main idea here is to uh, match the person with the internal structure of the company and the and his uh, his knowledge so I would say this is a fun process it is uh, not something that you come like in college and you just take a question is the answer it's more of uh, opening interview we also learn from the people from the candidates so yeah i would suggest to people to, to try out uh to try out their knowledge or and their their personality match with our with our team mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would also add to that. Uh, definitely apply at HTAC. Uh, maybe me and uh, Kurle will be your interviewers and uh, we can have a, a very fun discussion. And uh, I promise it's fun to work with us and uh, we're doing some amazing things here. So come and be a part of it. Great, great, great to hear. And uh, that will be already one hour and one minute. And thank you. Everybody, more than 1,000 people that applied, more than 2,000 views already. Uh, and uh, no matter where you're coming from, Philippines, India, there's opportunity. Who knows also for the HTEC, but there's definitely an opportunity to get the answer from Milan or Marco on your question. And uh, stay tuned. Uh, we would love to hear more from you, and we'll continue with Tech Forward in March. Thank you all, and uh, best regards from HT Group. 
Thank you, guys. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, guys.